Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. On today's podcast, we wanted to talk about this idea about the shadow, which is something that has certainly come up in previous episodes, and we usually take a minute and uh, define it, but we haven't really sunk into it and explored it deeply. It was one of Jung's major ideas. I, I think it's very important in Jung psychology. I think it has a lot of relevance, uh, both personally and culturally. Uh, so we wanted to spend a whole episode on it. And and we should just say that when we talked about doing this topic, it is such a big topic that we felt it important to limit it in some way. So today we're really going to be talking about our personal experience of shadow, how we find that, how we confront it, what we do with it, how we integrate it. And perhaps how we even work with it in a clinical environment. Sure. Okay, well, let's start with a definition my simplest uh, definition, um, because it helps me keep it in the forefront of my mind, is that I think of it as the underbelly of the ego. Mm-hmm. It, it's there, it's connected with my conscious, rational, or we hope rational mind. Um, and it is the underbelly that's hard to look at, that is hard to feel really connected to. And it's often kind of loaded with feelings of disgust, profound discomfort, and a feeling of wanting to push it away. Yeah, I think Jung said something, I'm going to not get the quote exactly right, but something like, the shadow is everything we would not like to know that's true about ourselves or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then why would we bother to even explore it or want to lift it up into consciousness? Uh, Jung says it's the doorway to the real. Mm. And um, That's so great. The doorway uh, to the real. And, and so it helps us become more whole. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the things that we're very uncomfortable with, you know, are, are not things um, that are inherently repulsive, but might be some uh, creative aspect of ourselves or some disowned aspect of our ability to really be assertive mm-hmm. or bold um, that could really bring us a greater sense of enlivenment and, and freedom to be uh, more of ourself. Yeah, I mean, the idea of the shadow has a sort of developmental component. In other words, we have some ideas about what it is and how it develops, and it goes something like this. That when when we're uh, a child, we get messages from our parents, from our culture, from our teachers, about those aspects of us that are not allowable. And of course, this is a totally necessary process. I mean, you know, when you're raising kids, you have to teach them, you know, that they, I don't know, don't don't use toilet humor at the table routinely in polite society or that kind of thing. I mean, there's all kinds of things that we have to teach our children are not appropriate. And often they relate to, you know, sexuality and aggression are two big things that often wind up in the shadow. But it could really be Lots of other things too. Yeah. For gender example, roles. gender roles. It could be uh, something like, you know, in our family, we do not boast. You know, it's a family value that we're very humble, for example. And then so anything that feels, you know, any impulse to toot your own horn, well, that's that's bad, you know, so it gets kind of pushed off in the shadow. And so our shadow kind of gets bigger as we grow up. And then we come into an adulthood with this, uh, you know, the, the poet, uh, I think it was, was it Robert Bly who wrote the, who called the shadow the long bag we dragged, we drag behind us. So, uh, you know, we, we spend all this time kind of getting uh, cultured or whatever and deciding which parts of us we're going to split off and not know about that will be in the shadow. And then there we are, we're adults and we have this shadow, this, these parts of ourselves that we really don't want to know about. And then the question is, so what do we do about that? And it's, it's very, very complicated 
as you said, because much of these potential parts of our personality are banished into the unconscious uh, when we're very, very young, which means the shadow parts of ourselves often remain in a highly instinctive state, making them feel very dangerous later in life. So I often explain it to my clients is, you know, when you were a little boy, if you were raised in a family where aggression was not um, tolerated, the aggressive part of you was banished into the wilderness and it grew up raised by other wild animals. So finally, here you are at 30 and you have your first corporate job and you really have to learn how to be very assertive. And then you call your aggression back from the forest. It has never been civilized. So it first shows up in a very roaring, very primal state, which makes us very ambivalent about our shadow. Right. It's like the ego doesn't have a conscious relationship with that part of the personality. And then therefore that part of the uh, personality has not been terribly civilized and doesn't come back in a very sophisticated form. But um, that's secondary to what you were saying earlier about how do we create personal shadow? What's the mechanism of that? And Robert Bly um, has a lovely book, The Long Bag We Drag, behind us. And here's just a little quote from it. Behind us, we have an invisible bag. And the part of us our parents don't like we, to keep our parents' love, put in the bag. Then we do a lot of bag stuffing in high school. We spend our life until we're 20, deciding what parts of ourselves to put in the bag. And we spend the rest of our lives trying to get them out again. Right. That's really very poignant. I'm thinking that the parts that we put in the bag are, are not just things like aggression, but strong feelings that we should not have. So if that was a a parental value about not being aggressive, what do we do with our feelings about, you know, I'd like to hit my sister, or I'm really mad at mom. Uh, That's what goes in the bag is my access to those feelings that I have. And, and then to continue with the example of the person who then is, uh, enters corporate life, uh, th- that's the, the wild animal in the woods is this intense feeling about aggression. And now it's really loaded yeah. uh, with, with guilt and fury and rage and envy and a whole host of other things. But we're really talking about uh, integrating these feelings mm-hmm. that we were not supposed to in quotes to have. You know, that's that's an interesting thing, Deb, because I you know, I see it you know, that the goal, for example, when you're raising kids, and perhaps it's not really a coincidence right now that I have teenagers, uh, but the one of the things that we're trying to do as parents is teach them to manage their feelings so that you don't want to disallow, ideally you don't want to disallow the feeling, but you want to try to model and teach ways of dealing with the feeling it might be okay to be really angry at your sister, but it's not okay to whack her over the head with a hammer, right. that kind of thing. And also boys don't cry. Mm-hmm. So now we have, uh, you know, Robert Bly's hypothetical young man, since he wrote a lot about uh, psychological development of males, of don't hit your sister, mm-hmm. you're, you're bigger, you're a boy, boys are gentlemen, they don't hit girls. Uh, neither do they cry. And you could elaborate on this of all kinds of feelings that then get relegated to shadow. But well, but I want to really make a very important distinction between socialization and shadow making. I think they're related. I think they are somewhat related. But I think, first of all, shadow making is in the realm of repression. And repression is an unconscious um, process. We don't know that we're repressing That's something. That's true. And the idea of shadow is it is unknown. Like if you know that you want to do something, but you're socialized to restrain it, that's not shadow. That's a socialization. That's a conscious socialization process. The shadow for Jung really meant, I am surprised. I don't know where this is and I can't find it. And then therefore, it shows up in projection because the psyche is so desperate to to lead us there in some way. So in the idea of repression is that something in the core of our personality discovers in one way or another that something is truly unacceptable 
And as a way of staying safe and staying in rapport with our parents and the other authority figures, it is cordoned away and forgotten. And there is an amnesic quality to the shadow making process. So it isn't being talked about, but it is It is absolutely communicated, this is unacceptable. And often it's not necessarily verbalized. It might be, but it also may just be contextually obvious that certain things are not okay and or never have any space mm-hmm. to be acknowledged or verbalized. So also, if a child's raised in an environment and certain parts of their personality are never acknowledged and verbalized, they can also wind up falling into this amnesic separation and cutting off place. Like these things we don't want to know about ourselves. I mean, I I think that's a good point. I mean, just a, a little example. I remember when my kids were small, they would say things to say, you know, the babysitter or the nursery school teacher say something like, um, you know, I I hate spinach. And they were told hate is not a nice word. This was this was very much in the milieu at the time that you were you you taught kids not to use the word hate, even in the context of you know, something like spinach. And and it really is this sort of disallowal of a whole range of experience, right? So we could imagine that if a kid is kind of repeatedly told, oh, we don't say hate. No, that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty big thing then that has to kind of get cut off and put into the shadow. So I'm still uh, on the track of the feelings and imagining, uh, you know, for your kids that it's related to a feeling that you really mm-hmm. shouldn't have. So it's again, it's loaded of mm-hmm. uh, 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 we we don't say hate here, and that there's that feeling is transmitted of th- this is something that's really bad about me. Mm-hmm. I, I I I guess I really shouldn't hate spin. Okay, I just kind of don't like it. So it's a feeling realm that gets disallowed through shame and other kinds of feelings from adults that we catch. And it can be very subtle. I remember realizing in grade school that I shouldn't cry. Mm. I might have been in second or third grade, and I fell down and I cried. And then I looked up and I saw the face of one of the male teacher's aides and this look of disgust on his face to see me dissolve into tears. A shame. And and nothing was said, but I absolutely knew that me crying like that was was suddenly had become disgusting. Wow. And there are numerous other very nonverbal reactions that children are given that tell them without without any of this explicit language just this kind of recoiling or disgust. And boys are very powerfully um, informed by what older men find um, unappealing in their behavior or their character, which is communicated in body language and mm-hmm. other kinds mm-hmm. of much more primal but definitive informations. Yeah. And I remember deciding as a child, I will never cry again. Ooh. I remember it in my mind. I was a sensitive kid, so I wasn't able to keep that contract. <laughs> But it is, um, it's something that is powerfully done. And I'm thinking, of course, the same is true for girls. Oh, yes. Uh, that we really pick up what is appropriate, culturally approved or disapproved, uh, gender-related behavior. Girls are absolutely not to get into fights and uh, to be caretaking and uh, not to have aggression. Mm-hmm. And the list goes on and on for for both boys and girls as children. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and and it's communicated in many ways beyond simply telling mm-hmm. someone that's wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it also shows up in rules. You know the the, ex, the overt expectations of what are the rules um, in your kindergarten class, and what are the rules and expectations in other environments. It's um, it's enforced. You make a good point, though, about the distinction between uh, socialization 
and repression, and that it takes something really powerful, like like your incident in the schoolyard around crying, that has an emotional load to say, that's it, I won't do it. And you were in the third grade. But imagine if that had happened to you when you were three, you wouldn't have had enough ego, enough consciousness probably to make that conscious cast, contract with yourself. It wouldn't have maybe gone right into the realm of the unknown, that dissociated, exiled realm where I really don't know that part of myself. And some of that happens in infancy. I mean, parents are constantly responding or not responding or responding negatively yeah. to an infant's behavior. Many, many years ago, I actually is not a client, it was a friend. And I was living in central Virginia back then. And so I was uh, becoming friends with a bunch of country folk, actually, which was very interesting because I was a city boy. And this fellow was talking about his raising his daughter. And he was a very earthy uh, manual laborer. And uh, he said, you know, when my daughter was um, in the crib, I just got sick and tired of her crying. And I went into that crib and I slapped her until she stopped crying. And you know what? She never cried again. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. And I had occasion actually to come to know this girl as um, many, many years later as a young adult. So that's an incredible repressive mm. event. Mm -hmm. And the child didn't cry again. That really took that emotion and that reaction and the nervous system mm -hmm. of the child was absolutely certain that this was not okay. And when children receive a stimulus like that from the environment, um, it's as if God has done that. I mean, it goes in as, as one of, you know, as the 11th commandment, thou shalt not cry. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge emotional charge necessary to relegate something to the shadow realm in us. And then it becomes a huge part of a psychoanalytic or psychotherapeutic process. It's big work. It's not easily yeah. done. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, Robert Bly kind of ends that quote that you shared, Joseph, with, you know, we spend the rest of our life trying to get it out. And Jung was very interested in what do we do with this stuff that's in the shadow? Because we don't think about it usually as we go about our day, but those parts of us are still there. We're still dragging them behind us. And, and they can influence us in many different ways. And one of the one of the ways is we can project our shadow. Right. So we do need, by the way, to create a shadow. That, Absolutely. Just so that just so that we're clear about it, mm -hmm. that um, when we are born, you know, we have, you know, a, a huge and whole personality full of primal, powerful, instinctive behaviors, and we if if we are raised in an environment where none of that is shaped or repressed, uh, we're going to wind up in jail probably later in life. So we do need to make a shadow in order to, in the first half of life, accommodate the culture. Mm -hmm. And and so Robert Bly's quote that we used earlier doesn't really lean into the necessity of shadow making as an acculturating power and as an ability to formulate a personality that's functional for us. And later on in life, we begin to find evidence that we have a shadow through projection. Mm -hmm. So projection is thought of as I, or I think of it as an almost life-saving phenomena of the psyche, that there is in the center of a personality, a remembered, a held image of wholeness of what it was like in the beginning when nothing was split off. And that survives even the most repressive environments it, that is still inside you, inside of all of us. And it presses upon our personalities to incrementally acknowledge it, acknowledge these parts which we've lost touch with. And one of the tools that the center of the personality will use is to cause a kind of magnetic attraction between you and that quality out in your environment and cause you to kind of hone in on it and once you're honed in on it, the thing that 
people experience is all the ways that they defend against it. And that shows up as hatred, disgust, uh, avoidance, criticism, accusations, Mm -hmm. attacking. Mm -hmm. And depending on how much violence was involved, yes, depending on how much violence was involved in the splitting off process when the original split happened is commensurate to the amount of violence that people feel in their attacking of it Mm -hmm. when it's finally come to light in the environment, or at least I think so. Mm -hmm. So we split it off and we project it out there uh, onto an in-law or a colleague or the Mm -hmm. lady across the street um, or somebody in public life. I'd like to rephrase that. We don't split it off and we don't project it. It is not a function of the personality, is that it is split off and then something deeper than us projects it on the personality and we have no control over that. Right. And, you know, Jung was very careful to say that projection is normal, that we all do it. And in fact, it's how we first come into contact with those parts of our psyche, not just the shadow, but other parts as well. That, that are unconscious. So it well, it's certainly normal and it can be healthy, but it's sort of like, what do we do when we project it? So for example, if, and, and by the way, a, another important thing when we're talking about projection from a Jungian uh, perspective is that, you know, if we're going to project a shadow quality on someone, it will be true that the person upon whom we're projecting has a hook so uh, let, let's see. I'll just I'll just use this example from my own life. Actually, that um, it was definitely a family value in my family that that you had to you had to express humility. You had to be humble. Couldn't brag. You couldn't draw attention to yourself. That was considered really poor form. So um, I worked uh, uh, with a, a woman who she was pretty. And it was pretty clear that she knew she was pretty and enjoyed that. And she sort of, she, she, she was a show off. She, she was a show off and, and sort of a flirt and kind of enjoyed, enjoyed basking in other people's uh, appreciation of her charm and beauty. And boy, I'll tell you, she got under my skin, man. <laughs> I just, I, she just, you know, and, and that's, that's always when you feel unusually provoked by someone, maybe everyone else is also bothered by the person, but it really drives you crazy. And then, you know, you're dealing with a shadow quality when it has a lot of energy. And and that was very much the, the case for me. Now, so the idea about a hook is it's true that this young woman really was a little bit of a show off, Right. But but it's that's not that's not saying that that really the the energy for my the, the strength of my irritation with her was about my quality of maybe wanting sometimes to be a show off that had been disallowed in my family. So the feeling was out of proportion yes. to the provoking person and incident. Uh, and I think that's a little litmus test of, yes. you know, when I'm just, you know, driven crazy by it and, uh, you know, then can hopefully reflect on, wow, um, there's something's really yeah, trying yeah, to get my attention right. here. And it can also be um, a subtle connection. You know, there's a, that hermetic aphorism, um, as above, so below. But often there's a second phrase that's missed for people is, as above, so below, but after a different manner. Mm, That's perfect. Which is really important. So for instance, um, we haven't talked about this least, but I could imagine this in a client where they're really targeting this coworker who seems to be showing off their beauty or in some fashion. And after deep introspection, the person who's upset by it may feel in their shadow that they shouldn't show off their intelligence, Mm -hmm. that showing off in almost any category can provoke the uh, energy, the shame, or the Mm -hmm. upsetness inside of them. So if we deal with this idea of projection too superficially, which I do hear in some communities, that we look at this person and we say, oh, she's showing off how pretty she is, 
oh, so that must mean that I'm not allowed to show off how pretty I am. Right. It's formulaic. And often, then, yes, it's formulaic yeah. and it doesn't really land. And then people think they have this task of, well, I guess I better show off how beautiful I am mm-hmm. to uh, to get this rolling here and really <laughs> admit that I'm just like everyone else. And then I have seen people work with this and then have and not resolve anything because they didn't go into a more much more subtle analysis of what is it mm-hmm. categorically mm-hmm. sometimes and sometimes it can be extremely subtle like somebody can hook our shadow because they used a turn of phrase or a tone of voice or they have a posture the way they set mm-hmm. their shoulders can make me land something on mm-hmm. them and jung talked about this quite explicitly how subtle a hook can be. Mm. So we have to be very careful about how we unravel the mystery of what has been provoked in Yeah, and I think when we feel that provocation, the attitude is curiosity, right? That would be the perfect attitude. That's the attitude that can lead us into that subtle unraveling. I'm thinking about um, the example we've um, landed on Mm -hmm. of uh, the, the co-worker who was so very, very pretty, but that the shadow might not be, oh, I have to get in touch with how pretty I am and how cute I well dressed, et cetera, et cetera, I am. But it might the shadow might be I have to get in touch with my own feelings of unworthiness and ugliness and the shame around that. Uh and I'm thinking about a time when um I was years ago in my first analytic uh endeavor of having a dream about this alien monster that lived on another planet who was good but would, was terribly repulsive and ugly. And uh, now there was an example of a split-off part of me who had to actually live way out there in space. <laughs> and um, that when I awoke and wrote the dream down, I found myself in tears, flooded with these feelings of... You know, that that monster's ugliness, and I was revolted, and I felt sorry for him, and had compassion, and um, I, that is the work of bringing it into consciousness. Of bringing that green monster home. Yeah, and we're mm-hmm. not just a, a logical, and certainly not a formulaic thinking process, or not a thinking process only. And it took uh, it took time and work and more feeling uh, to find well what part of me had been so literally alienated. Mm. And and I that image of the of the monstrous object having to be put so far away that it's mm. on another planet. Yes, that uh, that really speaks to the incredible distance that that the psyche will try to put between the waking personality and whatever the unacceptable impulse is. I had a a client um, who's just a a wonderful, determined uh, young man. And we had been doing a lot of shadow work over many years. And uh, we were in a session once where the shadow figures had come back in a clamoring way. And he put his hand on his heart and had this sweet look on his face. And he said, oh, my beloved degenerates. (laughs) (laughs) I thought, that's perfect. That's That's perfect. (laughs) Yeah, because, you know, one of the things Jung famously said is something like 99% of the shadow is pure gold. And it's this idea that that what we put in the bag contains often, I mean, there there may be stuff that needs to be, you know, as Joseph, as you said earlier, kind of repressed. But it's possible that there are so many treasures in the bag. And there's so much energy in that bag. And that's why we do work with shadow. Mm-hmm. There's something really enlivening, worthwhile, and whole making yes. to be found there. Rather than, you know, are we just pawing through the slag heap of our uh, repressed feelings? No, there's treasure to be found. Mm -hmm. And it's the timing of finding the treasure that's very important. Because, and this goes back to child rearing, that there really are things that have to be put into the shadow bag when one is a child because the ego cannot grapple 
is not muscular enough to sublimate it or to turn it into something useful. So some things really do have to be put away, which is why the psyche creates a shadow. That the shadow is also called a functional complex in the psyche. That there are certain psychological structures on the inner landscape, like the ego, like the shadow, the self, a mother complex, a father complex, a few other things that we need in order to kind of have a basic ground in the psyche. We need a shadow or else we couldn't evolve as an ego. And that's part of it, is that the ego does have to have primacy of place as we grow up, so that we can operate and decide and uh, steer our lives. So Jung felt that his work was often the work of the second half of life, but partially because the personality was muscular enough to confront the shadow, which is often thought of as the first stage of Jungian work. Yeah, so that the ego could have a conscious relationship with these qualities. And not be overwhelmed by them. Mm -hmm. Because that we bring up, we'll talk about confronting the shadow, but one of the dangers of confronting the shadow is shadow position, Mm -hmm. is where we discover some very complicated and perhaps socially unacceptable part of ourselves And then an individual can become possessed by it and begin living it out in a very florid and sometimes dangerous way. Yeah. And I I mean, of course, a famous literary example of that would be uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? I mean, this is probably one of the clearest uh, literary examples of shadow dynamics is that we had the very, we have the very urbane and gentlemanly Dr. Jekyll who is experimenting in his laboratory with a substance that changes changes him into Mr. Hyde, who is capable of doing all kinds of monstrous things, all the things that are disallowed in Dr. Jekyll's life. And and this is also this is a good place to mention, by the way, that 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 we also think of the shadow as compensating the persona. Ah. So the persona is the mask that we wear in the world. It's what we project about ourselves. It's what we want people to think of us. And and the shadow would would sort of be exactly the opposite. What we don't want people to know about us. And in the story, of course, eventually, um, Dr. Jekyll is unable to control the changes into Mr. Hyde. And it's been a long time since I've read it, but I think he kind of gets stuck there. But that would be that idea about possession. So let's just summarize the first half of our conversation, which was about identifying personal shadow, which we've kind of uh, walked around for a bit. But there are a couple of concrete things that a listener could do which has to do with very intensive and determined journaling. And one would be to begin to write about what you absolutely hate in other people. Yeah, the thing that really just gets your goat. Really gets your goat. It may be something (laughs) that irritates you strongly and irrationally or disgusts you. But these qualities that are just so provocative to you and other people also add in noticing things that happen in the dream life, that you can often dream about people or figures that you find abhorrent or highly negative. Mm -hmm. And to be able to really write it down and then try to analyze and deeply describe and understand what those qualities are so that it's not just a superficial statement, but for instance, even in the idea of the beautiful woman who seems to be showing off to really write about that. In what ways does she show off? And, and what is it about and, that that and bothers what, you? What bothers you about that the most? Yes. That's a good question. What, what is the psyche honing in on? Mm-hmm. Because it wants you to learn something. We mm-hmm. project because the psyche wants to bring something to consciousness. Mm-hmm. It's not a failure. It's a function of the psyche. So doing that intensive and very honest self-confrontation sets the stage. So that's part of identifying personal shadow. And now we're coming into the idea of how do we confront the personal shadow, which is the next stage of at least theoretically saying, this must be part of me somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. I've got to have this someplace in me. Yeah. Jung said something, oh gosh, I wish I could remember this exactly. He said, you know, but to deal with the personal shadow, we really have to go right into it and kind of drink that cup to the dregs. So when when you find someone that has a shadow, you know, you say say that you 
say that someone in your life is getting right up under your skin, just, you know, just fingernails on a chalkboard. And don't we all know someone where we felt that way? Absolutely. <laughs> so then, you know, follow the process that Joseph outlined of really getting curious about what exactly is it that really bugs you about that person, and then see if you can feel a resonance in yourself. And then it might be time to kind of get curious about that, either imaginally or perhaps in real life to really make friends with that person, you know, to really, to really approach that person and get curious about that person or that the inner figure of that person and, and, and try to uh, move into it a little bit. That would, that would be one way of exploring that. So you'd almost be externalizing the ritual of befriending your own beloved degenerate mm -hmm. or, or beloved mm -hmm. despised mm -hmm. function. Mm -hmm. That's one way. If we were to move that into an introverted way, we could create an or call forth an imaginal figure. Mm -hmm. You know, what would an inner show off look like? And Jung was very much in favor of these imaginal journeys. So to imagine that and imagine interviewing them, talking with them, and even if you were to write that down, you know, to even write a little play. You know, that you might imagine in your mind of meeting the inner show off. And what would you talk about that would help you understand them, not attack them, mm -hmm. is the really important thing. So, a sort of an empathic extension into an engagement uh, with uh, your own imagination, maybe with a real world person. And of course, I'll add to that writing down dreams mm -hmm. and then engaging in a process of kind of dreaming the dream on of with the figures in that, but moving toward it with what you talked about, Lisa, curiosity of what is this? Uh, what is it about? Rather than quickly judging it and saying, well, that's terrible. I would never be like that. I, I don't know. I don't want to go there. Uh, go there. Yeah. And it might even be, you know, depending on what the quality is, right? It, it might even be, well, okay, I, I never do that. I never, um, you know, to, to my own horn. Maybe I'll Maybe I'll try it next week and at that staff <laughs> meeting and see what that feels like, you know, sort of almost stepping into it a little bit. Which goes into the idea of ritualizing the shadow. Mm -hmm. So it may be, like you said, very uncomfortable to, you know, go and have a makeover and show up mm -hmm. like a glamour shots at the next business meeting, but it might be very empowering to simply remind the your team of coworkers that you accomplished a really successful right. task right. that you'd all been working on. So there's indirect ways that we can express it. I th I'd mentioned this before, I think, but Robert Johnson in his little book on shadow, you know, he had discovered this inner hostility and aggression inside of himself. And Robert Johnson, for those of you that may have ever known him or heard a lecture from him, uh, he's passed now, but he was an incredibly introverted um, and not a terribly expressive person. So to imagine, you know, Robert Johnson really raging at you is, is a very strange kind of idea. <laughs> but he, but upon discovering this part of his shadow, he noticed that he really needed access to that before he would walk on stage because he was such a withdrawn person. So he would wet a big bath towel in the hotel, so it was very dripping and wet. And then with all his might, he would slam it into the basin of the tub. And there was something about the, th the slamming of this object and the way it would spray and its loudness that he would suddenly have this upwelling of aggression. And then he would stride out <laughs> um, you know, down towards mm -hmm. his lecturing venue mm -hmm. and felt that that was a real gift. Hmm. And so that was a kind of confronting, but also honoring mm -hmm. of his aggression that worked mm -hmm. really well for him. You know, I wanted to uh, bring up a fairy tale, if I might, because there's a there's a fairy tale that I have right at the top of my head right now that I Go think for is an it. excellent uh, tale of shadow dynamics, and it's Snow White. Uh -huh. Aha. So Snow White, of course, is very um, sweet and pretty and demure and helpless, and and her evil stepmother is uh, mean and wicked and vain. We have that vanity and thing envious. there. Envious. 
and envious. And so we can imagine, you know, one way of thinking about fairy tales from a Jungian perspective is that every figure in the fairy tale is an aspect of the dreamer's psyche. I'm, I'm sorry, of the, of, the, of the main character's psyche. So you sort of have to pick a character and sort of say, okay, so if we're looking at it through the the psyche of Snow White, say, or that's that's sort of the equivalent to the dream ego, if you will, then the evil stepmother would be her own split off aggression, vanity, wickedness, uh, savvy. And so Snow White is still kind of trapped in this kind of innocence complex. And boy, if you know, Snow White is such a picture of an innocence complex. And, uh, you know, she's out in the woods, she runs away. And who does she come to? She comes to these seven dwarfs, these kind of earthy characters. Well, it turns out that in, in the earliest version of this fairy tale, it, the dwarfs were actually thieves. Oh. Mm. So she's, she's uh, living uh, with these kind of shadowy little figures. And and in, I think most versions of the tale, they are uh, they do mine, don't they? They certainly do in the Disney movie. Mm-hmm. They're miners, so they're, they're stalwart, hardworking. Yeah, blue but they're collar. also chthonic. They're like earthy. They're of yeah. the earth. So yeah, that's they that's work that underground, kind of, right. which we might mm-hmm. uh, compare to the unconscious extracting and, its treasures. Right. But she still hasn't, even though she's living with these shadow, shadowy figures, she still hasn't integrated the shadow. And what we know that because her stepmother comes and says, oh, would you like these laces? And, you know, as when we're cut off from our own shadow, we are in danger of being victimized by others because we don't have access to our own aggression, right? So, you know, she's so, excuse me, but she's so stupid, She's like, oh, you know, sure, I'll take the laces. And then, you know, she dies down almost, she dies and falls down almost dead. And the dwarves have to come home and rescue her. And they say, don't open the door. But then it happens again the very next week. It's like, ah, oh, sweetheart, what were you thinking of? But she can't, she is susceptible to being, um, to being preyed upon, right? By, by these kind of aggressive dynamics in her own psyche. They're, they're not integrated. And the very last thing, of course, is the apple, which mm. is a, a symbol goes along with, uh, with temptation, right? She cannot resist the temptation of that apple. She falls down dead. The dwarves can't do anything now. This fairy tale always bothered me for a while because I couldn't figure out why she just had to lie there dead in a glass coffin before she figured it out, right? And some people say, well, it's a terrible anti-feminist fairy tale because it shows that she's just passive and she needs to be kissed to wake up. But I, I actually don't think that's what's going on. I think it's important that she dies, dies with a piece of apple in her mouth. And I see this as that she goes through a long period in which she seems passive and fallow, but really she's metabolizing mm. the, the kind of poison of the stepmother. So she's integrating those qualities. While she seems inert outwardly. While she seems inert outwardly. And, and so how do we know that she's actually integrated the shadow when she wakes up with the prince and they're going to get married? She invites the stepmother to the, to the wedding and they give her iron shoes and she is danced to death by the iron shoes. So Snow White's no longer so sweet and poor, pure and innocent. She's happy to torture her stepmother to death. And so that's how we know that she's integrated her aggression. And oftentimes in fairy tales, when a figure dies, it just means that the quality has been integrated. And this shows up in dreams. I think about a dream that a client had, and he was an elderly, tremendously sweet, kind, appealing guy. And he had a dream once about this very hirsute, muscular guy who swaggers up to him and and stands off with him. And then the dream ego, who's this gentle old man, is roused to fight. And Mm. he winds up pummeling this guy who easily kind of masters him. So one interpretation that I have of the dream is that he really represents this potential to be aggressive. And that when he just comes into the proximity of the dream ego or just approaches the conscious life of the dreamer, it fills him with this capacity to fight. 
which is then played out in the dream, which is also exactly the kind of medicine that this fellow needed in mm -hmm. his life. Right. So he needed to learn how to fight. So just being in the proximity of the queen over time allows the, the innocent psyche to absorb some of the shadow's power mm -hmm. as it did for this uh, fellow that I was working with. And then we are enlarged. Yes, yes. we are more whole. And, and one of the risks always is we are enlarged in a way that other people might not really love about us. And that's part of the initiation of integrating shadow. Is that yeah, I mean, everyone likes Snow White. She's so sweet. Absolutely. But, you know, at the end of the tale, she's, she's kind of a bitch. Or she has that know? capacity. Yeah, she has the capacity. And she has a capacity to defeat her enemies. Mm -hmm. and, and, and people that are incredibly innocent often can't access that. Yeah, that's right. And in a fairy tale, of course, things are really outpictured. Mm -hmm. um, as if it's happening out there. So um, somebody, a, a Snow White type of uh, real world tale, you know, would not literally involve uh, having the stepmother in iron shoes being danced right. to death. It would be, uh, now I have access to my feelings of uh, fury and aggression. And I can protect myself. And I can protect myself and I don't have to actually do anything. I don't have to act it out. That's right. That's, uh, because that's, now I know, um, you know, I can't stand that bitch. Well, <laughs> but, and sometimes the act, the enacting of the energy is actually very constructive. So for instance, if we have a very collapsed, passive worker, and is somehow maybe their supervisor is tremendously sadistic and aggressive, at a certain point, that aggression hopefully will rouse up in the collapsed worker and they'll quit. And quitting mm -hmm. is a way of expressing Absolutely. your aggression, like yes. saying, yes. go to hell, here's my resignation, I'm out the mm -hmm. door. Mm -hmm. And that is and that is a right. mobilization of the shadow that's being projected onto the aggressive supervisor. Mm -hmm. It's very common. We probably can all think of a moment yeah. like that. But we can also think of how much we wound up cheering our friend on. We were like, yes, you finally resigned. That it's almost a relief to see them expressing a little bit of that heat mm -hmm. in their personality. And taking care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, of knowing that, uh, knowing that he knows what he knows. Or, you know, the woman who has a difficult stepmother really and truly. Of, and now I take care of myself. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not locked into an interpersonal battle either of how do I tell my boss off or talk back to somebody in my life. But he quit. Well, yeah. I'm moving yeah. on. It's, it's, Goodbye. It has, That's a form of healthy <laughs> aggression. It feels integrated. And yes. I think you said, Joseph, it's a question of having access to it. It's not like we become that thing. It's it's like we have access to it, which is different. Right? We have access, and it can be in consciousness, and we can choose, be in choice mm -hmm. about what am I going to do about this. Well, maybe I it's time for me to move out of my home, my family of origin. Maybe it's time for me to quit and get some training and get a new job. But it's a choice rather than just a reaction. Mm -hmm. Right. So somebody, let's say who's raised in an extremely conservative home and all forms of sexuality are tremendously degraded, that anytime something seems remotely sexual, mother has a face of disgust, father shakes his head, the fantasy is that your parents immaculately <laughs> conceived you, <laughs> you know, where sex is highly denigrated, then all of a sudden this young person winds up in college you know, um, the pressure to be sexual inside of themselves finally comes out of the forest. <laughs> it begins to inhabit their body. This can go a lot of different ways. And one um, shadow possession can sometimes be a kind of wild, dangerous promiscuity. Mm -hmm. And this shows up in popular uh, culture and uh, in this idea of the preacher's daughter syndrome, um, which I know can seem kind of sexist, but it's pointing to a kind of archetype of being possessed mm -hmm. by the shadow in a way that um, can, in this day and age, can really put you at risk. An integrated example of that, which shows up a lot in our offices as therapists, 
is somebody comes in and says, you know, my sex life in my marriage just is awful. It's just dead. It's always been dead. As a matter of fact, I've never enjoyed sex and maybe I'm even non-orgasmic. And then as the sexual shadow begins to be invited in and integrated, you know, it might show up as just taking a couple of sexy little risks in the marriage and and um, trying on different ways of expressing the sexuality or role-playing or a lot of the other fun things which can happen within the structure of the marriage but still invites the shadow in a ritualized way to enliven something that's lost its life. Now, what I think you're pointing to is that the integration of shadow doesn't have to be overwhelming. Or destructive. It, mm -hmm. We take steps mm -hmm. that are safe, that we can choose, whether it's journaling or trying out a new behavior or finally getting ready to quit a job. So we do it step by step, not in one big uh, sort of overwhelming whoosh of uh, from the unconscious. Because I know people are often uh, anxious about it and even afraid of it, of am I going to be overwhelmed? And no. Uh, and it can feel good to finally quit that job that you've hated with the bad boss, uh, or to try something new in the bedroom, or to sit down with yourself every morning over coffee and journal and write about anything you want, uh, just self-expression. Mm -hmm. um, there are real rewards to this. Otherwise, it would just be such an awful process. But people feel good about these things. Mm -hmm. It's well, it a brings, victory. It brings back that yeah. which has been exiled. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff is explicitly golden in as much as the culture really would applaud you if you took it on. One of the examples I love to use is uh, brought forward in that movie, Educating Rita, uh, which is just a totally charming movie where this uh, very expressive uh, woman, I think she's a hairstylist, uh, in midlife discovers and honors this impulse to go back to college. And uh it absolutely lights up her entire personality. And over the course of the movie, she really discovers that she is a scholar and a philosopher and how, how enormously important it is for her to have that validated and to be lived out. And when you see the movie, you think, well, why would anybody resist something that fabulous inside themselves? But people resist their positive potential all the time yeah. if they were uh, raised in an environment where that positive potential was disallowed mm -hmm. in one way or another. And, and many things are disallowed when we're children, both culturally and circumstantially, which hindsight being informed 30 years later seems ridiculous, but you may have lived in a really different world 30 years ago, as most of us did. So things like you know, scholarship and em emotional sensitivity in men and sexuality and uh, the impulse to be enterprising or to take appropriate risks or to publish a book, to quit your practice and retire because you're, you're ready to move into another kind of different expansion in your life or to come out of the closet if you're gay. I mean, there's all kinds of examples of things that when they're added into us, that the people around you will start applauding and say, it's, wow, it's about time. And I think it might be about time for us to switch to a dream. Hi, this is Joseph from this Jungian Life podcast. Lisa, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us with as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. So here's a dream 
uh, submitted by a 34-year-old male who works in the IT field. And I'll provide a little bit of context that the dreamer had this dream a few months after his dad had died, who had been very much in his thoughts. I'm in my dad's wood shop in the basement of the home where I grew up. I needed to unscrew a panel on a metal box, and I'm finding the right screwdriver. The first one I pick is too small. Mom hands me a better sized one, a Phillips head with four fins. Somehow, it is a very large size, and I notice the fins on the head are rusty. I sand away some of the rust on one of the fins, but when I come to the second, it's covered in masking tape. Instead of peeling off the tape, I try to sand away the masking tape. But the sandpaper continues to sand into the screwdriver fin itself, which is somehow made of corrugated cardboard. I'm puzzled. I feel a pit in my stomach like I've made a mistake. I find that only the first of the four fins is made of metal and the rest are cardboard. I undo, like you would undo on a computer, to get back to where I was after sanding the metal fin. The cardboard fins are intact again, and I'm relieved. I then unscrew and open the panel door. The feeling he had in the dream was puzzlement and unease. He also mentions that while he was growing up, he and his dad would work together in the wood shop. Mm. It's a really wonderfully complicated dream of doing and undoing and seeking, but I, I feel overall that it's such a positive dream in as much as the task of opening the box is finally achieved, although it has to go through this very interesting circuitous process. Yeah, and it's, a, it's all about finding the right tool. Mm-hmm. It feels like a, a bit of a fairy tale where um, it, there's a task uh, or searching for the treasure mm-hmm. of uh, the quest. Uh, I need to unscrew a panel on a metal box. And then there is all the stuff with the screwdriver and the fins and sanding it away and not to be um, uh, skipped over the masking tape. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, he has help from from mom. Um, made a mistake, but in the end, he finds the the way to it. He accomplishes the task. It's sort of like uh, pulling Excalibur out of the rock, or um, finding the, the the special fountain that has the water of life, or something like that. Yeah, and it does. I mean, I like your Exc- Excalibur reference because this does seem to be a task of the masculine, right? And there is something phallic both about swords and screwdrivers, I might add. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but to, <laughs> to sort of start right at the beginning, it's the setting. You know, we always pay attention to the setting. And it's, I'm in my dad's wood shop in the basement of the home where I grew up. And he does tell us later that he and his dad would often work together in the wood shop. So somehow this is the realm, the, the dream places us right in the realm of the father. Mm-hmm. And it's a particular to the father because I'm, I'm guessing, of course, I don't know here, but I'm going to assume that mom didn't usually hang out in the wood shop. I mean, maybe she did. That's not saying that's not possible, but mm-hmm. but that this seemed to be a place, uh, a kind of um, uh, crucible that mm. f- that that kind of contained father and son energy. This wood shop, and it and in that father son environment, uh, my grandfather on my father's side had a wood shop in his basement, and it was a really functioning wood shop. So. While my um, grandfather wanted to introduce me to it, there was also a lot of hovering because you can hurt yourself. Yeah. Um, my grandfather had actually cut one of his fingers <gasps> off and he used to 
love to like turn on the table saw saw and then wave his little stubby finger at me in this kind of be careful admonition, which clearly had an enormous impact on me. So there's a way in which the wood shop, oh, God. <laughs> but I mean, there is the kind of a male initiation yeah, in that, yeah, you know, it's yeah. like these tools are real and they could, you know, like mm-hmm. this table saw is is serious stuff. Mm-hmm. He really did allow me to learn how to cut wood and measure it and and do some of that yeah, work. And so there's a real mentoring that happens. Yeah, but there was there? this introduction to danger mm-hmm. in the wood shop mm-hmm. also. I think a lot of people have mm-hmm. just a acute feeling about that in the wood shop, but these are tools that can both help you and they can hurt you and these power tools are seriously powerful. So there's, I think it's a wonderful initiatic and mentoring environment. And there's a mystery that as much as the, the boy was with his father a long time in the basement, it's the mother who hands him the tool to unlock the mystery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when he first picks up a screwdriver, he picks up one that is too small. And it's the mother principle in his psyche that says, you can pick up something that's bigger yeah. and approach the father mystery, yeah. which to me, that's that's so important, is that if you approach the unlocking of the father as if you are small and boyish, you won't unlock the mystery. The mother knew him as her lover and her husband and has perhaps her equal. So she has the authority to say, you can have, you mm-hmm. need the bigger attitude Mm -hmm. (laughs) to unlock this mystery. Mm -hmm. You have to come to him as a man. Mm -hmm. Um, There is a phallic imagery going on here. Absolutely. Of unscrewing and screwing, and phallic in its symbolic sense, not simply sexual to reduce it to that, but that ability to operationalize, to make it happen, to insert um, it's phallic in its most symbolic sense with help from the mother, except that there's one fin that's made of metal, the others are made of cardboard. And so there's something that hasn't maybe fully developed or fully solidified. It's provisional or something. May, maybe, but I want to say that the real problem is not that it's made out of cardboard. The problem is that he misinterprets the rust on it. Mm-hmm. Because he looks at one of the fins and notices there's rust on it. Then he decides, oh, that's the most important thing here. So then he goes through the whole rest of the dream, um, sanding off the rust, and then it's tape, and then it's cardboard, and then he's kind of mucked up its utility. And then he has to go and undo all of that sanding stuff, all of the manipulation of the object, returning it to the state it was in when the mother mm-hmm. gave it to him, it's intact, and then he can unscrew mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. panel. Mm-hmm. So it's this reaction he has to the larger screwdriver, which is part of this journey, almost a Percival journey, in terms of searching for the grail. He has to go through this whole complicated process of relating to it, and in a certain sense, misunderstanding what's important about the tool in his hand. Like thinking, well, removing the rust is really the pivotal mm-hmm. thing. Well, and it's sandpaper, which is abrasive. Absolutely. So it's this sort of, uh, um, you know, is there something in the streamer psyche, perhaps a tendency to kind of self-abrade, you know, mm-hmm. to... to um, it could be an OCD thing, actually, mm-hmm. where people decide everything has to be scrubbed and clean before it can serve its purpose Mm -hmm. as if ego has to be in charge here Mm -hmm. okay well then this has to be sanded away um and and sand away the masking tape as well it reminds me of the at the end the t.s Eliot thing about um you know going through a whole process and then understanding the original situation um, as it really was, that he there's more understanding of, well, I don't have to do anything here. I don't have to sand and peel and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. It was fine as it was, and it does have four fins. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's interesting that it's a Phillips head, and uh, the structural 
meaning of four. I'm maybe stretching this a bit. I don't think you but, are. But uh, four stands in Jungian theory for a kind of wholeness. And if you think about the the shape that a Phillips head makes, I mean, it's really a cross. It's a story. Mm. Yeah. It's a, yes, it is. Mandala-like. So what we could imagine between being given the Phillips head and then sanding it until it's not useful is it reminds me of analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. This idea that you're being given a tool, you know what you want to do with it, and then you fuss with it so much that it actually can no longer have its utility. Yeah, and if you think about it, I mean, if you if if you had a screwdriver that was a little rusty, it, ordinarily, unless it were very rusty, rust is not going to impede the functionality and utility of the screwdriver. No, and if you've really if you're driven to get the job done, you're going to stick a rusty screwdriver in, and you're going to do it, yeah. and then maybe when you have some luxury of time, you can go back and and tend all your tools which which actually is an interesting fatherly thing to take care of your tools well but if the central mystery is get that panel open yeah. timing of sanding it is it's um something to look at so well, well i'm thinking about when we say we're rusty you know like, okay mm -hmm. i'll give it a try but i'm kind of rusty on making this or doing that that there, there's a place I, i'd be curious about you know where do you feel you're rusty uh, is mm -hmm. it in the realm of the father, father energy, um, a sense of agency because you make things in a wood shop? You know, what, what's that about for this particular person? You know, what I'm really struck by is this box. Because somehow, oh, the box. right. So what is <laughs> what is this box? And of course, I would want to ask the dreamer, is this a real box? You know, what do you think was in the box? But somehow this is, it feels sort of like an approach to the mystery. Yes, that needs to be unlocked, and it feels somewhat initiatic. I agree completely. And and there's this way psychologically that when a parent passes, you almost feel the wheel of the generations turn a click. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, I, I think this is something that can happen. This is a relatively young person to have lost his father. He's only in his thirties. And there's a way that when when your when your father passes, you realize that you are next in line, mm -hmm. and you now stand at the head of the generation. It's it's a very deep process. That so whatever is in people. the box is now your responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I would be really curious about what that is, and even what's the feeling around the box. And I'm thinking about the panel. It starts off, he says, a panel on a metal box right at the outset. I need to unscrew it. And then at the end, I then do, uh, my word, unscrew and open the panel of the box. But that it's a panel, uh, I'm thinking about my fuse box at home, mm -hmm. and there's a panel of all those connections to uh, this light and that electrical all appliance. The mm -hmm. All the juice in the house goes all through the All the box. juice. And that the panel protects that, protects the circuits and the fuses from being meddled with or being injured by the environment in some way. So there's a certain kind of power beneath the panel, perhaps, that only now does his psyche think he can begin to relate to perhaps even safely or responsibly? Mm -hmm. And that may go to why he became so fussy with the rust on the screwdriver. As we approach learning about our deceased parents as they really were versus how we imagined them, we can have this sense of, are we ready to know that? Are we ready to see them that way? And to go through sometimes a kind of fussy feeling of anxious preparation, a kind of neurotic preparation to just know what's true. The mother principle just gives him what's necessary and go to it because she's already seen him as her companion. She doesn't think of her father about his father as this iconic figure. It was, you know, a known equal. So there's a casualness to me about the way the mother offers the screwdriver mm -hmm. and says, just here, this is all you need. Um, but the boy has to kind of perfect or purify the screwdriver in order for it to be worthy of opening the mystery of the panel. 
um, because he sees it in a much more heightened way. Like I couldn't possibly approach the mystery of the father with a rusty or a dirty screwdriver. It has to be all be sanded down and be clean. I, I want to lean into that a little bit with this, the figure of the mother that, you know, it might be a dream about the personal mother. And what I would imagine, by the way, about this dreamer's mother is, I mean, this seems like a, a pretty positive uh, figure in the dream. But there's also a way that the mother is the thing that kind of, um, you know, and what I'm thinking of here is the book Iron John, actually by Robert Bly, whom we referenced earlier in this episode, that really is about the task of masculine initiation and about how part of that is that uh, the, the boy needs to take something from the mother, that the mother kind of guards the secret and in in the 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 book which is based on the grim fairy tale iron john the boy needs to retrieve the key from under the mother's pillow mm. it's like somehow the secret yeah. to manhood needs to be taken from the mother mm. and and you know in this sense i mean in a literal sense if you have something behind a panel that's screwed in place it's almost like the screwdriver really is the key yeah yeah you know so um so here you know and that it seems not insignificant that the mother is handing him the key okay so something from the mother part of the psyche the mother complex is standing beside him as he approaches the mystery of manhood really mm, i think that's great i think yeah. that just nails it and uh, I would just like to add what a very positive lysis or ending to the dream mm -hmm. that um, I then unscrew and open the panel of mm -hmm. the box. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the treasure hard to attain has been attained. Mm -hmm. He does it. Uh, the task has been completed. And yet the main feeling in the dream was puzzlement and unease. And I think that that's a natural reaction. Yeah to taking on the responsibility of the father's box mm -hmm. and the contents of it. Mm -hmm. That it isn't going to all be kind of power and sunshine, but this is the beginning of a whole other journey in the same way that getting the key to let Iron John out of the cage was just the start. It was just the start, mm -hmm. right, yes. And I imagine that this dreamer is just at the start of something. Mm -hmm. The box is open. Mm -hmm. And and the way is cleared. <laughs> yes. And the only thing that's getting in his way was his fussiness in the dream, that once he just kind of got to the task, it opened. Mm -hmm. That any yeah. stumbling block to opening the father box was really just in him. Right. But the psyche is saying, we, you've got our support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there, I think we can leave it. We all have smiles on our faces. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living This Jungian Life.